Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups. And today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. All right. This week, I have a treat. It's one of my nearest and dearest. I want to introduce you to Lizzie Klein. Lizzie is a proven startup leader with a talent for continually scaling early stage businesses. She is the founder of Mozzie and Zo. And Mozzie and Zo is a fine jewelry company for customers who really value high quality pieces, minimalistic and elevated design, sustainably sourced materials, and it is all produced locally in New York City. Prior to launching Mazi and Zoe, she was the founder of SuperDuper, which was that wildly popular iOS app. She served as an entrepreneur in residence at Brand New Matter, and she was also the VP of product at Grubhub Seamless, Everyday Health, and Star Media. And then earlier in her career, she worked as the general manager of the Zagat survey, which was later acquired by Google. She had PL responsibility for all digital platforms. So through three IPOs, three acquisitions, Lizzie has continued to be recognized for creating over 300 million in equity value through strategic product development, generating revenue, and building out high-performing and very diverse teams. So I wanted to bring Lizzie on today's show because she is really an example of what's possible when we continue to look at our career, create a career strategy, and refresh our career. She has started this current business when she was just shy of age 50. And I hear from so many people that they feel that they are behind or that they're losing time or that they have to catch up. And lately I've been hearing from people say things like, well, you know, I only have about 10 years left of work in me. And I'm like, what? I mean, if that's what you want, sure. The events of 2020 and beyond brought Lizzie to create new products and donating proceeds to non partisan voter awareness organizations and reproductive rights. And finally, in this episode, we talk about mindset and daily habits. I love that Lizzie doesn't follow the productivity hacks out there. She's found her own way to make it work for herself. And it's unconventional based on everything you hear about what entrepreneurs and startup people need to do. So listen in and check out the show notes for how to get the details on everything Lizzie's talking about. And also she's very generously offered a 20% off coupon to her jewelry at Mazzy and Zoe. So you can also enjoy her jewelry too. Ready? Let's dig in. I am so excited to introduce you to my friend, Lizzie Klein, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lizzie Klein from Mazzy and Zoe. It is so good to have you. Uh, Lizzie has been in the startup world for quite some time. And a lot of what she's done here, I want her to share with you. One, you know, she did work in corporate at a certain point. She left corporate. She decided to go out onto her own eventually. But in the in-between, she worked at various startups. So Lizzie, take us back to the early years. I want to know, what did you want to be or do when you were a kid? I wanted to be glamorous. (laughs) Well, I would say that that is definitely a dream and a wish fulfilled because you absolutely are glamorous. When do you think it came to you then? So, I I mean, I was always into clothes. I was a clothes horse in high school. You know, I probably packed more than anyone ever when they went to college. And it was sort of all I thought about. And I majored in textiles and apparel. Uh, So I immediately out of school, I worked in fashion uh, before I became a little bit disillusioned. The fashion business in the early 90s was a little bit not quite as businessy as it is today. And then, you know, happenstance landed into it, landed at a startup at Time Warner. So Izzy, take us through the highlights of the last few years before starting your own business of what you did 
what it was that you learned that helped you make the pick or the impetus to go to the next place and how all along the way, it's almost like snowballing, right? Like you're pulling all of that great information experiences with you to go into the next role. I hear from a lot of the people that I work with that they're often worried about that they're wasting time or like that they have to nail it or they have to find the right job at the right time. And, and, you know, sure, that's one path, but I think equally it is interesting when we're going into experiences and garnering an experience and having something new and then bringing that to the next experience and how it all, it all fits together. So take us through that, that story for yourself. You know, this is all going from early days of internet till now. It's, it's all been the internet. So every step of the way, you know, technology was evolving. So every job meant I got to learn something new. I, I tried to, as I followed the path, you know, I started in e-commerce, which was building on my initial fashion experience out of school. Uh, and then content and community, more elements of online, learning about how do you, you know, by the time we're getting to the gap, you know, working on mobile apps and really understanding, you know, getting the content in the taxi, what's the right content to put in a taxi versus in a phone and understanding those nuances to create the best customer experience. And yeah. so I've been the head of product prior to Zagat, but at Zagat, I explicitly um, wanted to be the general manager. So I'd have PL responsibility because I've not had that before. And product at the end of the day is a cost center. So if Mm. you are always the cost center, you really need to understand the other side of this to make the full picture. So that was where the Zagat, for me, I didn't necessarily think I was going to learn a whole bunch of new technologies. I did. That was was cool. But um, it was a little bit more about developing that business, those Mm. business jobs. And one of the things I learned pretty quickly about that is I can do those things, but I really care about product. And mm. so when I got recruited for this job at Balika, which was getting back to e-commerce, and Balika was a website that was de- dedicated to everything care. But I got to get back to e-commerce and really understanding, you know, what's well, so, okay, how's a customer going to use, you know, if they can't smell the shampoo and they can't, you know, touch the tool, what can we do? How can we give them an experience that makes online work? I wanted, I always wanted the digital experience to be better than what was already available. Because otherwise, what's the point? Follicle was a really great learning because e-commerce had evolved a tremendous amount since I'd been doing it, you know, 15 years earlier. Um, and then for Follicle, I went to Seamless and Grubhub. And again, like, what is something you use every day more than ordering food? Um, right. And that that was, to me, a fascinating project. You know, everything about it was so interesting. We had so much data um, about how people use things. Um, so... I mean, it was also scale, frankly. And your data was probably not only cuisine, but time of day and understanding, Everything. like eating patterns. So let's fast forward a bit and take us to how did you make the decision to go out onto your own and start your own business? So when I left Seamless, I had basically had, you know, the biggest product job there was at the time. You know, we were a billion dollar company. Yeah, the head of product, like... There's not a whole lot out there that's going to be a next step. And I actually struggled a little bit to think about what comes next. And after a bunch of interviews with up and coming startups, you know, here and on the West Coast, um, all of a sudden I remember sitting in Key West, like lounging around and going, oh my God, I want to be CEO. Yeah. It, it, I didn't have those examples. You know, my family, my parents were both government employees. It never occurred to me to think I'm an entrepreneur or I should start the business. Um, And to be honest, I didn't have bosses who told me that either or a mentor who told me that. And so I had to come to it really slowly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And that's when there's an idea that my sister and I had had kicking around for years and years that we always talked about. And I was like, you know what, I'm doing it. Uh, which was the impetus for Super Duper, which was a an app that showed the drugstore dupes for luxury cosmetics. Because what it sort of came down to is how many shades of brown eyeshadow are there really? And, you know, knowing... So, that hey, so, so people who don't know, because I met you when you were still running that, take them through, like, 
I'm looking at a Chanel nail polish in a shade of red. What happens? Take take them through the experience of what you did, which is so, so brilliant. When um, when you open the app, you would choose. You know, am I looking for Dior, Chanel, Louboutin, whatever the luxury line was? You tap that, and you know, again, this wasn't the most sophisticated app. Uh, you scroll through the list of their colors, tap on the one that you were just looking at in the store or where I'm seeing in the magazine. And we would tell you, you know, that's equivalent to cover all this. That's, you know, not exactly a match to OPI, this one, but it's close. And, you know, it's a little redder. And then so that you could just figure out exactly what you needed. It's a little secret of the cosmetics world that the colored cosmetics, the nail polish, the eyeliner, uh, the lipstick, they're kind of all the same. That it doesn't, you know, there's not all branding in the planet that make eyeliner there, you know, and it, the quality does not correspond to the price. So giving people an opportunity to, you know, save a buck. Um, to me, I always wanted people to spend their money smart. And in my mind, savings on cosmetics so that you can buy great shoes is a great trade <laughs> Right, right. Okay. So then how did that, so that was your first foray into running your own business. Then what happened? So I ended up, it's actually funny because they brought it back. Um, the app was built on something called Airtable, which mm-hmm. was at the time uh, Facebook bought it and deprecated. So my app is no longer useful. My app's not making money. It's super popular. It's, you know, in magazines, people love it, download like crazy. I never paid a cent for advertising, but it's not making any money. And so uh, I made the difficult decision to just shut it down rather than spend another, you know, whatever, $50,000 to build another app. Um, and went to, well, I wanted to think about what's next. I actually went to be an entrepreneur in residence at a venture capital fund. Because again, mm. what parts don't I know? I don't know that part. I, I yeah, explain to, to everyone I'm, what an entrepreneur, because I used to always say, um, lady in residence and you were like, no, Jill, entrepreneur. <laughs> I was like, right, right, right. That's what it is. <laughs> explain to everyone what an entrepreneur in residence does. Sure. I mean, I think they potentially do different things at different venture capital funds, but in my role, the job was to, you know, look at opportunities coming in, meet with entrepreneurs, see if they were fit for the company. So just, you know, another screen, but also then to work with the companies that had already been invested in, to work with those entrepreneurs in whatever they needed, you know, jump in if they need some senior product help, whatever I could help with. Um, okay. With the idea that I'm supposed to be cooking up my own idea that they will then back. Got it. However, oh, wait, I called you an entrepreneur in waiting. That's what I thought it was, not a lady in waiting. I was like, wait, actually, what were you, entrepreneur in waiting? You're like, no, Jill. Yeah, no, but arguably it is. Arguably it's just like sit on the bed, chair for a while, think of something good, and then we'll fund you. And then we'll figure out how to monetize yeah. it. And we'll However, the, okay. people that I was, the fund where I was working is really focused on travel. And the next thing that I wanted to do was not travel. It was Mazi hmm. and them. Uh, and so I was researching Monzi and Zoe while I was there. And I told them, you know, I know this isn't going to be up your alley. And to be honest, I don't think it's a venture type company. I think it's a bootstrap. Um, so I'm going to, you know, leave here all good terms. And I'm going to go launch Monzi and Zoe, which is the jewelry company that I started in 2019. Amazing. Amazing. So, so tell everyone sort of what you do and how you got into sorority market. And of course, everyone's favorite TikTok, Bama Rush. So Instagram is becoming hot in 2019. I mean, arguably it was hot before then, but you know, really everyone and everything, particularly for shopping, shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Hit for shopping in 2019. And I was, and you know, the influencer concept came up 2019. And one of the things that I was noticing and looking at younger influencers is that they were, you know, scrolling through all the time and they were many, many of them were sorority women and none of them, they would be wearing like their sorority sweatshirt and, you know, their water bottle and their backpack and stick on their laptop. There's sorority on everything, but none of them was wearing sorority jewelry. And that seemed really weird to me. I've always been into jewelry. It's sort of a tribal thing, you know, people wear the same thing and you know, recognize, you know, game sees game kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, jewelry is just such a clear representation for a lot of people of their values and what they care about. You know, remember the Lance Armstrong bracelet, right? And right, the right. Um, 
And so I started looking into it. And what I found was that these jewelry that was available to them was either the same stuff that they had sold me in, you know, 1980, and the, um, which was not cool and in style back then, or it's like kind of cruddy stuff that's going to turn green really fast. You know, there was, there was sort of like it, the price point jumped from $22 to $350. And there was nothing in between. Mm. Uh, and it just didn't add up to me. Um, so I started interviewing and asking people about it. And, the, you know, these women are wearing, they were wearing like Cartier bracelets with their sorority sweatshirts. So it's clear there's, you know, some disposable income here. Yes. Um, and started interviewing and finding out, you know, in general, you know, I don't, I don't totally believe in focus groups because I feel like asking people what would they do isn't that important relative to, or isn't always accurate relative to what they do. do. Yeah, right. um, so I decided I was confident enough that I was going to do a little capsule collection. I um, brought on a designer, a jewelry designer who's a friend who's amazingly talented to help me sort of gin up these designs for, um, I picked Cap Alpha Beta as the starting sorority. Lucky for okay. you. <laughs> the, um, I was not a Cap Alpha Beta. I was an AOPI. But the, uh, <laughs> I liked Cap Alpha Beta's height. <laughs> and the AOPI is a the um, But anyway, so Dan and I developed a very small capsule collection through connections. I hired a production manager. You cannot get jewelry made in New York City without a production manager who knows the ropes. I hired one, she shepherded, had tremendous patience for me who knew nothing about jewelry and had a hundred questions every day um, to make a collection. And I brought it up to the Kappa Alpha Theta chapter at Columbia University and showed it to them, you know, hey, what do you think? Uh, and I had a hundred percent sell through. Every single person ordered while I was there. Uh, everyone came. However, I'd say sell through. I had a hundred hundred percent pre-orders uh, because I didn't have any merchandise. Get in pocket. Right, right. Uh, and so that gave me confidence to go ahead. I developed a full collection for Canada Alpha Theta, built it out, uh, and then since then have become licensed for an additional 17 national uh, sororities. So how many sororities do you license for all in right now? 18. 18. So set, okay, 17. Got it. Okay. Wow. That is, that is amazing. And so what is something like when you see a trend like Bama Rush, what, what does that do for your business? So Bama Rush is like nothing I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> you know, for those of, for the uninitiated and apparently uh, unbelievably there are some um, <laughs> people, last year, 2021, Bama Rush took over TikTok, caught everyone by surprise. Um, I got name checked. And so sorry, the women were doing outfit of the day. So both the potential new sorority members were doing the, hey, I'm wearing this dress from this place, this thing from this place. <laughs> and the existing, the, the members we were recruiting, some of them were doing them as well. And somebody name checked you know, and this is my Monsi and Zoe necklace, which was amazing. Um, and amazing. sent a whole lot of traffic my way. Um, and so this year I was ready for Bama Rush. Um, and I haven't been name checked yet. Bama Rush is over. Uh, we just finished Clemson and Ole Miss. But, you know, there is everyone else got on board this year. It's given me an opportunity to be opportunistic and sort of, you know, comment all over them. And, you know, be all over TikTok on these people. And TikTok is actually driving a good amount of traffic to my site. You know, this is the first time TikTok's been performing for me, which is great. Uh, and maybe it's only a sorority rush season thing for me, but I will certainly be ready for January rush as well. That That's amazing. I mean, it's, ama it's amazing how it's also like timing meets um, preparedness, right? That that this year being prepared. And then of course the timing. So how do you, when you think about running a business now and all aspects of it, right? You know, I always joke as, um, you know, I consider myself a small business owner, not necessarily an entrepreneur, but they're interchangeables. I consider you more of uh, an entrepreneur, but one of the biggest things that I've learned for myself over the last five years of working for myself, that if I did not scale my brain, I was not going to be able to scale my business and scaling my brain into what's possible, scaling my brain to deal with the celebrations as much as the frustrations to be able to handle it, to, to roll with things. And then, you know, keeping the highs not so high and the low is not so low and just be really managing my mindset with it. How have you 
attacked that in your business and managing your mindset and managing sort of being an entrepreneur? That's a great question. I actually admire. I think you do that very well. Um, and I think I think of it more, I, I think I'm less proactive than you are and I'm more coping. So I sort of have two coping mechanisms. One is how I manage my daily schedule and sort of what I'm going to do each day. And it's sort of micro, right? To do it a day at a time. And the other is, you know, taking a lot of walks, <laughs> just getting air and taking walks. Like for me, my best idea is very rarely for me when I'm sitting at the computer. It's always, you said something funny when we were having a drink or I saw somebody wearing something walking by me or that's where my ideas come from. So okay. those two mechanisms kind of, I think one keeps me on task and the other one keeps me thinking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like that. And then how do you weave, you know, so you have all these experiences throughout your career and you obviously also have your personal values as to what you want in business. How, how is, how has been the result of you weaving your personal values into the business that you created? How has that changed for you? And how does that feel be able to really own all aspects of it that anchor to your values? Yeah, I've been really fortunate. I started the business with the intent thinking about, you know, one of the most, one of the values, one of my key values is just sort of quality. I, I care about things being good. I don't like cheap things. I don't like fast things. I want the best. And I, you know, so to be able to create a high quality product that's handmade in New York City also meant something to me from a, New York is my adopted home. I love it. And to be able to, to contribute to any manufacturing staying here feels really good. Um, so making a great product, making it well, um, that sort of hit my initial values. And then in 2020, when the world was blowing up between COVID and a whole lot of civil rights issues, it didn't feel right to me. Again, to get back to my values, the idea of pimping jewelry in that environment felt kind of tacky. Uh, until it struck me to create the necklace that I'm actually wearing right now. A the boat necklace. necklace? Yeah. I have one too. We'll make sure um, all of you know about that. We'll put that in the show notes, the boat necklace. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, and the, from the outset, I anticipated, you know, I planned to donate proceeds to a patient organization. And I was not savvy enough about how these partnership things work to contact the organization. I just decided I'm going to donate to you. Um, and so that's not true. I think I tried once or twice, but I didn't try that hard. Uh, that I'm going to donate proceeds from this to When We All Vote, which is Michelle Obama's organization to drive voter adoption. And um, about a week into launching it, the organization actually called me and asked me mm. to be partners on it, which was amazing. Amazing. Um, I was super flattered, you know, in this tiny business that nobody's ever heard of. And they somehow have seen this product and you know, came out, you know, to get me. And then uh, shortly after uh, at the DNC, uh, Michelle Obama was wearing a vote necklace when she was on television. Now, it was not my vote necklace. Uh, it was another maker's necklace. But what worked out really nicely was, you know, that whole rising sea lifts all votes was... Google searches. Everybody started vote. Googling, I'm sure, for vote necklaces, right? Amazing. I, think I remember you calling me saying, put a Facebook ad in. <laughs> I, think I, remember <laughs> I think I remember that too. I was like, we got to get on this moment. <laughs> so I'm just sitting, I'm sitting watching because I'm watching the DNC and I'm hearing ding, ding, ding. My phone is set to ding for orders. And I'm like, what's happening? And all of a sudden I realized the whole world's Googling for vote necklaces. Mine's cuter than the one that she was wearing. It worked. Um, and so we donated a ton, you know, felt great to be able to donate a ton of money to that organization. I've never wanted to be a cause marketing type company. I sort of like to think of Kenneth Cole's model, which is I live my values. You might see them in my advertising, but I donate personally versus the Toms to the Warbies that are, you know, buy this and doing something for somebody else. Sure. However, that seems to work for these kinds of things. So right now, um, in response to the war on reproductive rights, I have launched a program called Venus for Restart, where um, I partnered with another female-led company called Styx to, they set up something called the Restart Donation Bank, which funds uh, emergency contraception for people in need. So for every purchase from my Venus collection, I am 
buying a morning after film for somebody who needs it. Uh, mm. And that feels really amazing good. Work. Them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, it's such an important work. And when you can really have your values be aligned yeah. in such a way. I love the Kenneth Cole example too, because I think that neither is right or wrong. One is do do good, be good in the world. And then, you know, you have money to do what you want with it um, and donate to causes. And of course the other is a Tom's model, which is more overt and saying, this is what we're going to do. And I think both work. So that that's amazing. Take us through, just as we're kind of wrapping up here, take us through, like, how do you continue to keep it fresh? You have people that support you, right? Both through uh, contractor and freelance positions, but you're effectively working. You're the solo employee of the company. How do you keep it fresh? You know, researching things online, learning, you know, I do carve out part of my week to just read the stuff. You know, we all get that pile of million newsletters and whatever. Mm -hmm. I, it's frustrating because I know I, I can't read all of it. None of us can, right, but the right. stuff like all week I do try I put you know two hours somewhere in the week and that helps is there a drive. time of day that you do that is there do you like a morning routine so it's just depending on the week I am wildly um inconsistent with my schedule <laughs> okay so that's really interesting that works for you clearly it does people you know talk about what is your most when when do you do your best work and when you most right. productive and my strategy, yeah, because I mean, some of it between, you know, workouts and taking care of the dog and all the other things that make my life happen, I just, you know, I'm not that consistent about when I do my work. Um, you know, I get up early in the morning, take the dog, I work hard, I take a break to work out, I come back, I work hard, but oh, wait, I have a lunch date. Um, so each day can be different. And what I do is I plan the day the night before, and I think... Um, when there's something that I've been putting off for a while, because I know it needs more brains, it's not just, you know, get her done. Um, I will, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. I block out time and say, this is what you have to do for the next hour or two hours. Nothing else is happening. And right. that's my best work. I, I would be willing to bet, you know, that I know the larks and the owls, is it larks and owls? Um, concept. Perhaps I could be optimizing more, but for me, just picking the time and really committing to it is what works to get the best work. And and that, that I would agree with too. Like if you have a pattern uh, that's a time management pattern between morning or night, great. But as long as you're doing it and blocking it and then going about it, I mean, I think that's really what it's about. It's understanding how your own brain and your own style works so that you don't get suffocated. And, you know, and keeping it fresh because I think that's, you know, if we're not getting constant inspiration, I mean, I know for me, even being home during COVID um, and also working for myself, it's the same thing. You know, how do I keep it fresh during the day? What are the walks outside, riding my bike? Um, you know, I live pretty close. I live in Manhattan, but I also have a home outside the city. So I live pretty close to the beach. Sometimes it might be going down there just to get it fresh because there's no... This has nothing to do with COVID because I choose to work for myself. There's no conversation in the micro kitchen. There's yep. no opportunity to chat as we leave the conference room. I don't have those anymore. So it's really important for me to connect. And I, I do a lot of connection also with, um, like I'll use the Marco Polo app with some of my other um, entrepreneur friends and just, you know, checking in and, and making sure that we're keeping things inspired and, and fresh and, you know, and working through challenges during the day. That's good. Okay. So a couple of questions for fun. What book are you reading or have you read that you would recommend to people? If we're talking about for business, I'm going to say um, the Emily Post business etiquette book. I know Ooh. you're not expecting that one. I was um, not expecting that. I am blown away by how many people do not get the basic manners to make a huge difference in business. You know, you've always asked me like, you know, how do you have such a great network and how do people... How do you ask people for things? And it's because I I was raised with you know manners and I keep carry them through with business. I will always write a thank you note. I prefer to write a handwritten thank you note. People remember that they notice it. Um, I don't ask people to pick their brains. I ask, I, you know, hey, can I help you with this? And I'd love to ask you about that other thing. Things like that that enable you. Reciprocity. And I, yep. Yeah, it comes from it comes from like foundation, what is that again, right? It's showing respect for people. Okay, is there a podcast, again, business or pleasure that you're listening to these days that you would also recommend? 
Uh, the one I always recommend that um, I think is super relevant for your audience is if you've not listened to it, there's an episode of Freakonomics uh, that is called The Upside of Quitting, mm. which is for somebody like me who does not let go of, you know, we were all raised, you don't quit. You keep at it. You just do it forever. Um, that the way not Gladwell positions quitting as a rational economic choice is phenomenal. It, it is so empowering. If you are sitting at your job and you're like, I can't quit because X, Y, Z, or I've invested all these years, I might be partner next year, whatever it is, the upside of quitting takes a look at them and says, okay, get it off the past, right? Where are you right now? Where could you be? Like, is this serving you? And I think I, that, I love it. Right? It's, it's so Yeah, I mean, I actually recall that episode. And I think with everyone talking about quiet quit or quiet quitting right now, I keep yeah. saying to people, don't quiet quit, right? I'm not telling you not to quit. I'm telling you, don't do it as an act of resistance, which keeps you in the resistance and in the quitting mindset. You can quit, whether it's mentally or physically, but choose where you're going to. Be right. deliberate. Be purposeful. Um, I did an episode recently. I'll link that up in the show notes around like, don't quiet quit, you know, mm -hmm. deliberately decide and making that decision. I mean, we're not saying don't quit. We're just saying don't, don't do it in a way that you're focusing on the quitting versus the focusing on what's possible and where are you going? Okay, this was such a delight, Lizzie. Tell them where they can find you. Thank you. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at, at Mazi and Zo. Uh, my website is mazianzo.com. And for listeners of this podcast, uh, I created a discount code. So if you want to go check out my jewelry, uh, it is not all sorority jewelry. That's what we talked about. Uh, but I have a broader line. Uh, use Refresh 20 for 20% 20 off your order, except for the Venus collection, because, you know, that's a fundraiser. All right, everybody, I'm going to put everything that Lizzie said in the show notes. So you will get all the information there. You'll get the, the coupon and the discount code in addition to uh, where to find her on the socials and her website. And thank you so much for listening, everyone. I appreciate you so much. And I'll see you next time. Bye, Lizzie. Hey, thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one -on -one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon.